Hey everyone, welcome to another great episode of Content Conversation. Today I'm excited to welcome Eli Schwartz. Uh, came down to us from the San Francisco Bay Area. He's a growth advisor for enterprise companies uh, of many different sizes, uh, mainly large ones. And today we're gonna talk about the landscape of SEO careers in 2020 and beyond. Uh, welcome Eli. Thanks for having me here, it's great to be here. So as a, as a starting point for this conversation, one of the things that I read from you that I thought was really interesting and a great observation was uh, there's a certain talent gap you've identified from the SEO world of what people need and what actually exists. So I would love to hear more about your findings in that article and what that means for people at home. Yes, the article was probably about two years in the making. It, what really piqued my interest in is before I started going off on my own as a growth advisor, I was working at SurveyMonkey, and one of the things I did there was I led the SEO team, which having director of SEO in my title on LinkedIn was, I guess, fairly attractive to a lot of recruiters. And a lot of recruiters would reach out for some really big companies, and they'd keep reaching out, and they, these jobs would stay open for a really long time. And the, on the flip side, I also hired a, a bunch of people in the last few years to join my team for SEO, and it was really, really hard to hire people. And I got interested in what, whether there was some sort of gap in the amount of people there were. You know, I'd done a little bit of research, I'd written a, a short blog post, but then recently I decided to revisit that by using LinkedIn Sales Navigator, which just allows you to open up all sorts of search filters on LinkedIn. I went in, I started by typing the word SEO, just as a keyword, and I got millions of people around the world. Not so relevant. <laughs> so then I, I narrowed that down to just the United States. Like how many people have the word SEO as a keyword in their profile? So it was 909,000. Then I narrowed it down again to how many people have the keyword SEO as their job title. That's only 25,000. So there's only 25,000 people in this entire country that have SEO as their job title, which means that SEO is more than just a line item of something they do. They're not an engineer, there's just someone doing Dedicated, SEO. Dedicated, yeah. And then I compared that against how many people were, how many jobs there were on LinkedIn. And this is much, much harder to filter out because they don't allow you to filter the jobs based on whether it's a key responsibility or just a, something in the title. Okay. And there are only 45,000 jobs. So there are 45,000 jobs that are looking for SEO, 25,000 people. Again, I don't know the exact mismatch there where these are, they're looking for someone that knows SEO or does SEO, but 45,000 jobs for 25,000 people, that's a serious talent gap. And then I looked at that by region. So like in the Bay Area, there are more people, there are more job openings for SEO than there are people that even do SEO. And this talent gap gets even wider as you break it down by years of experience, which is something you can't make up for by doing other tasks or gain responsibility. Right. So when you look at like 10 years plus of experience, there's only about 3,000 people that even have that in their job title. So severe shortage of people that have the skills necessary that companies are looking for. Again, one thing I was able to do on the job front, there are a lot of jobs that are looking for senior level people. They have a sort of a number of uh, years of experience. Again, harder to filter out by jobs. Serious mismatch. So, hmm. you know, from a- Pretty big gap. Pretty big gap from a demand, from a, you know, employer side, if that's a skill someone has, they're very much in demand. So on that on that wavelength, wh wh I imagine in doing this analysis, and you got there, you have a hypothesis for why that is the case. Why why do you think that is the case that that shortage exists? So I can look back into my own career and the people I've known as as I you know embarked on this SEO journey. I've actually had it really good. So I worked at a startup where they really really got SEO. Yeah, they gave me a lot of pressure about things that don't matter. They gave me pressure about rankings. They gave me pressure about you know, how much traffic we were getting on useless terms. But all in all, they valued what I was doing. They valued how important SEO traffic was. Is that SurveyMonkey you're talking that about? That was not SurveyMonkey. Oh, okay. It was a startup called High Gear Media. It was an automotive content startup, which ended up getting acquired. And they valued it. SEO was very important. But many people I've known, SEO was not valued. They may have been underpaid. They may have been a little bit abused as employees. <laughs> and as they wanted to improve their own work life, they just started doing something else. So as you think about, like, as I put in my blog post, there are all these people who have 10 years of experience, and they're not that many, whereas down at the bottom, there's a lot more people, right at the entry level, first year or two. You have to survive that gauntlet. You have to enjoy being possibly abused, possibly <laughs> underpaid, 
and then you know acquire more years of experience. And that's where I think there's a talent gap because if you have SEO as your job, or it's SEO as your job title, and you can move over to product manager or content marketer or a paid media analyst or engineer, get paid a lot more. You're doing a different job, and you know we no longer have those people in the SEO field anymore. And they will not make it to that 10-year mark where they're all very attractive to some of the bigger employers. You think that it is unique to SEO where they have it is more arduous in early stages? Not at all. But I what I think is unique to SEO is that it wasn't as valued by companies gotcha. as it okay. was as it should be. Now I think companies are valuing it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But back then it wasn't as valued. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean it, it, it goes back to, I think, luckily, companies like us, you can feel it as an agency. There is a, no shortage of good companies trying to hire you as an agency because it's the same problem. Like people go to agencies when they can't find a sometimes an in-house person often or a consultant that, that they can leverage. So those are things that happen. I think of, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Seth Godin's The Dip book, but it's one of, one of I recommend it for anyone early in their career as an instructive book. It's really quick read on when to quit, when not to quit. Um, but it's actually it's something we I see a lot actually in our own agency is we have a lot of it's specific in our content marketing role where it's, it is more arduous. There's email outreach that's repetitive. There is like a two year dip of like, you got to get through that dip. And some people get kind of close to the end of the dip and they quit and they might reset to a new role in their job. And they're probably going horizontally restarting well, the people that get through that dip kind of start making their way to that, I think, on the path of being able to get those, those more experienced jobs in an SEO type field. Yeah. I think what also is missing is in organizations that value the impact that the SEO team is making. They, I mean, we don't have a, a lobbying organization on behalf of SEO, so no one's really advocating for SEO. But essentially, companies view it as it's free traffic. So we have someone here to help us get something we were going to get anyways. And that's very much not the case. Like you look at some of the companies, some of the biggest companies now, the companies that IPO'd in the last year, many of them do not have an SEO team. They don't do any SEO. I, I searched on LinkedIn to see if they had anybody with those job responsibilities, and they didn't. You know, some of them attach SEO to someone that was not doing SEO prior. Like if, you, if the person that has the SEO in their title also is performance marketing manager, so they're doing paid media, you know they're not spending a ton of time doing right, SEO. <laughs> so I, I saw that in a lot of the, the, you know, the recent IPOs. So these are companies which they think they have free traffic. They obviously spend a lot of money on, on other sort of channels, and they, they don't value this source of traffic as much. How do you think with kind of the evolving landscape and the narrative of, of like zero-click searches and Google eating more of our Google traffic, is that contributing to that even more so is that you, it sounds like you're feeling the reverse where people are starting to value it even more but in some circles people would say or have the concern that are people going to start valuing SEO less because of that reality I don't know how you're experiencing that yes yeah, so I, I love you brought that up so first of all zero click searches is something that no one probably outside this room and outside this <laughs> industry has any idea what it is mm-hmm. so uh, we can talk about it, but I, I, you know, the, the executives at the companies that are affected by zero-click searches, they have no idea. They're probably looking at them all the time on their phones, but they just don't notice that right. it's, it's okay. bigger or better. But uh, on that note, you mentioned you know, zero-click searches and the, the recent narrative. So Rand Fishkin did some research around it. I personally don't think zero-click searches are bad. I think there's this concept of information arbitrage where you should not benefit from someone wanting to know you know, what time a game starts. Like, if, if that's all you've done is what time does the game start, Google should be able to give that away for free. Like, in, in the, the job I was at prior to SurveyMonkey, automotive content, one of the things we generated a lot of traffic from was how much does a car cost? We shouldn't be able to benefit from someone just Googling how much does, you know, a Volkswagen, a Honda, cost. Yeah, Volkswagen <laughs> cost. Google, Google has every right to buy the same information we bought and tell them. So if we were able to rank on that, and then we get someone to come in and sell some advertising. You know, that it's inefficient. So okay. I think zero-click searches aren't necessarily bad. But I want to go back to something that Rand actually wrote a year ago, where he talked about zero-click searches for the first time. And it was the first time I ever saw someone estimate the click-through rate from search to ads, at the time called AdWords, now just called Google Ads. So he had it there at about 4%. 
Okay. And then the number he had for organic was about 40%. And he used jump shot data. Okay. So what's interesting there is we're talking about it. There's a search page. Only 4% goes to ads. 10 times that amount goes to organic. The rest of it does zero click or, or something. Right. Okay. People bounce and they refine their searches. So 10x. The number that's driving that 4%. So I, I've looked at a couple of Google earnings reports. So Google's doing about $100 billion a year in just ads revenue. Okay. So 10x that amount is a trillion dollars. Now we have the value of search, basically. That's the value of search. Yeah. So if people were spending as much money on SEO efforts for that 10x number as they were, that's a good way of quantifying it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this could be huge. I mean, think about like, I don't know, the best paid position we have in America, an investment banker. Mm -hmm. They're just getting a piece of a deal that someone else is doing all the work. One company is acquiring another. They're going public on the stock Mm -hmm. market. Investment bankers are getting these huge bonuses. Here we have people that are contributing to a trillion dollars in value that is coming from search, and they're not necessarily valued. They may be underpaid. Okay. But they're, the impact they're making is certainly underappreciated. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess cir- circling back to the SEO career conversation, if someone was kind of starting over in their career today, or maybe or they're even like two to three years of experience, they're at that dip in inflection point, like how, how would you record how would you suggest they kind of move forward or structure their career to have the highest upside in the future? I think they have to advocate for themselves. Okay. So what I was able to do, and I, I got very lucky, was that when I joined SurveyMonkey, which is where I went after the startup, is they had never done SEO before. And I was able to say that we're not going to track rankings. I'm going to track revenue and track the value of that I'm bringing to the table, okay. which allowed me to really show my impact. So when I was compared against other marketers, especially paid marketers who had a significant amount of budget, you know, if someone's handing you millions of dollars, they really want to hear you defend why you're, you have a million dollars yeah, yeah. and what you're doing with that, or you don't get the millions of dollars, mm-hmm. you don't keep the job. And I was able to say I'm providing the same amount of impact from a dollar perspective. So I was able to grow in my career and learn more and, and you know, grow my team and all that. Okay. If someone's in their SEO career and they're being forced to give rankings reports and the executive doesn't care about them. They re- they, executives only care about rankings when they're on their phone and they're Googling and they're like, how come our competitors ahead of us? That's the only <laughs> time they care about rankings. It's the vanity, yeah. But it, you know, from an SEO standpoint, if you can say, I'm providing impact, I'm providing revenue, just like all these other teams, you get more visibility. Okay. So j- just to put, if you don't mind putting color on this, like, so did you in your situation, you, you maybe you have a salary review or like or a performance review at a certain month, a year, and you like go to your executive or your boss at that, at that time and say, this was how much I made, therefore you should pay me why, and leveraging that point kind of got you those outcomes? Or is that kind of how people should be thinking about it? That would be in a real, an ideal world. I don't think it could ever work like that. <laughs> yeah. I think more than likely someone would actually have to leave their job and make their pitch to another company mm-hmm. and say, this is what I'm going to bring to the table. You don't have any SEO. You're, I'm using a tool like Ahrefs or SEMrush to estimate how much you're spending on paid media. Your SEO is horrible. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can help you generate a million dollars of revenue off of SEO. And then when they're offered a salary, then that is when they could point out that that's not a very large salary. Oh, okay, to relative the to the brand. impact. But if you're, you know, someone's at a, at a job, they're, say they're on a team that everyone else is getting paid similar, right? And they're a larger company, I don't see them being able to make that argument. In a smaller company, if they made the argument of, I'd like to pivot my job to this and I'd like to provide more value, it's possible it could happen and then they can get a salary review. But at a larger company, I don't see any pathway forward. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that's a good point. In my specific situation in my career, I was SEO manager and I, basically did that value uh, pitch to another company that recruited me and got a certain salary and then went back to my other employer and said, this is what I'm getting offered. I was willing to basically lose the job or eventually start Siege. And that actually enabled me to short term get like a 40, I forget the exact number, but a pretty significant raise um, off of that leverage point. But I could see how a bigger company, if you they feel like you're replaceable against that next person in the org. Um, that can be a little less effective. So I guess in, the, in that situation, are you, are you advising, and have you been in San Francisco your, your whole career, I guess is one question? Almost, yeah. Yeah. How much do you think that plays into it? Because I'm sure there, in San Francisco in particular, there is aggressive 
location specific recruiters? Like, do people have to move to San Francisco to bene benefit in this way? Not San Francisco, but obviously tech centric hubs in the SEO context, or like, how do you think about location in the context of career? Um, so I, I don't think the industry has come around yet. And it's going back to the one more point that we were saying before is I've actually been able to articulate this better as a consultant, not as an employee, because as a consultant, I can say I, I'm not I'm here to participate in, you know, the weekly meetings of everything we're going to do. I'm not here to go to team lunches. I'm here to provide X amount of value and I can give that math. Whereas an employee is not necessarily able to do it. And I can say that from the engagements that I've had to date, that actually does go over very well because there is that math and you can show the value. And if an employee can do the same thing, they should. But again, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that employers and managers will be necessarily receptive to that. And then you know, to answer your question about location, recruiters I don't think have necessarily come around yet. Some of them are. So as they come around, and hopefully they should all read my, my blog post and with the data there, if they read that, <laughs> they will know that they can't be location-centric. But until they realize that they're going to, it's going to take them a year. And I, there was a role that reached out to me probably 18 months ago at a uh, Fortune 50 company okay. that's still open. And they're, now they're willing to hire anybody in the entire world but they're looking for someone with 15 years of SEO experience, <laughs> has worked at a company that does a billion dollars a year in revenue. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, maybe you know 10 people that could do that. Yeah. yeah so me. until yeah. recruiters come around to how hard it is going to be to fill these positions, they're still going to have requirements. But as they, as they come around to it, as hiring managers come around to it, they're really going to open up. They, you know, we'll take someone remote, mm -hmm. we'll take someone in another country. You know, sometimes hiring someone in another country has even more complications and they don't want to go that route. But if there's someone in another country they can hire, I think they will. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think with the remote first push, that's, I don't know how much you're feeling that in terms of your experience of recruiters reaching out to you and uh, how long ago that was before you started consulting. Um, but it, it does feel like it would become more prolific for recruiters to go a little wider. Of course, every, I think everyone prefers, I mean, even us, we're like Austin first and then remote as a backup. Right. Or something like that. Um, that that kind of works into our thought process. But cu curious, have you have you slowly seen a shift there? Of uh, it sounds like not quite yet, but may, you you anticipate that happening. I am seeing it. I am seeing okay. it a little bit because now that I don't, my LinkedIn has changed a little bit and doesn't look like I'm looking for a job. Recruiters are reaching out asking me if I know people, okay. and they tell me more and they say this is how much you're willing to pay, which is great. Like I should have done that in the past. If I wanted to know how much salaries were, just say I don't want the job, but tell me how much you'll pay my friend. Okay. <laughs> so, so I do see them saying we're willing to hire anybody anywhere. So I think they're coming around as these as these roles stay open for longer. They're coming around and they they're willing to look at different kinds of backgrounds. But to be honest, I actually think someone, even if they're remote, does need to spend time in the office, because as especially if you think about the bigger companies, where they're they have a lot of employees. You know, take a company. Uh, that has 10,000 employees and an engineering team of, you know, 4,000 people, being able to make sure someone doesn't screw up your SEO is hard if you're not in the office. Right. So even if someone's remote, they do have to spend time building those relationships, understanding what they need to do, understanding who to work with. So yes, they can be remote. Yes, they can do a lot of the busy work at home, but there, there has to be some time where they're, they're in the office. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you do that as a consultant where you're going in office for, I guess you're in San Francisco, so maybe it's easier? Very much so. Okay. Yeah, I have to build those relationships. So, I, I mean, Zoom and Skype and, you know, Hangouts makes it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but being able to, like, just talk to people and, you know, meet other people that you may not have had a meeting with, but, hey, I just want to meet you, you meet this engineer, that's very helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I guess for people... Maybe someone is in Houston or they're in maybe a, a, an adjacent area. I don't know. Um, uh, Napa, Valley, Napa Valley might not be great. But maybe it's close to a hub or something like that. Or how or should those people be, if they really care about being getting that 10 plus years experience role, like do they need to be moving into those main hubs? Or do you think in today's world it's like not really a requirement to progress aggressively in a career? So I think early in a career, someone has to be willing to do anything that they have to do. So that would be moving into wherever they need to be, taking that job that doesn't necessarily value them and trying to pivot into a job that does value them. I think once someone has that amount of experience where 
recruiters are willing to make exceptions. The consult engagements are willing to make exceptions. That's that's the time when I, I think they have more leverage. But early on, as people are acquiring that experience, and it, it's really, you know, it, it's the same as, as any career. You need specific stories. You need to build a portfolio. Okay. So if you're, you know, someone's not going to move to a, a hub, whether that's a industrial hub or tech hub or just a place with a lot of jobs and they, you know, they can, there's competition for what they're doing, then they may not get those interesting, port, you know, items on their portfolio where they've done interesting things they could talk about. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I, I think, especially when you're younger, taking that risk, going somewhere, you don't have to stay there forever, for sure. Um, I think that's a great point, especially to build initial relationships, leverage those down the line. It, it seems critical. Um, so, like, maybe thinking about the, we're sort of talking about the junior area. How about those people that kind of seem... Maybe it's an SEO manager, and they're kind of like sticking around that that general area. Maybe they're at a company that uh, doesn't value SEO as much, or maybe they don't value get as much value from SEO to, as compared to an enterprise company, and they can't seem to break through to a director or VP level job. Like, what should do you see any trends of like what that kind of person is versus this other person? What are they doing differently? What can this SEO manager do to get to that next level? So, at a larger company, they're probably going to have to leave. They're not getting that you know, the title bump. If once they leave, I think it's really about articulating the value they're going to bring. So if there's a director of performance marketing where there isn't a director of SEO, then there's a mismatch. Okay. They're not valuing it as much, and they have to be able to articulate of why it's the same or probably better because SEO is free. And there's, you know, performance marketing manager is going to be likely working with an agency, working in an ads account, but they're only working with a defined scope and defined teams, content creative, whereas the SEO manager that's articulating the value they're going to bring to the table, they're working cross-functionally. They're working with the engineering team. They're working with the product team. Mm -hmm. They're liking, wor likely working with the executive team. They're certainly working with the PR team. So if the, again, if there's a director of performance marketing, but there isn't a director of SEO, it's because they don't see that person as needing to work cross-functionally. And we don't see a lot of VPs of SEO. So what, that's another thing I noticed in my LinkedIn search. There really aren't that many. There aren't that many companies that care enough to give someone that title or that responsibility, and that I believe will change because as they recognize that you need someone that has that VP title to be able to tell an engineering manager what to do. You need someone that has that VP title that can tell the PR team, you have to do this. This is yeah. what we're doing. <laughs> and if you're just leaving it to a senior manager who has to now tell their director of marketing or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever line they report up to, who has to go up to its CMO and then to the CEO, those things don't happen. Gotcha. So, I mean, I could see also, I wonder if it kind of sort of goes back to, I, it'd be interesting to know, refine that LinkedIn search further is like how many VP jobs are there in not, in not Seattle or San Francisco where the organizations are big enough to warrant that kind of size and position title? I don't know, you think there's any trend there? I wouldn't think there, I, there, I didn't see any VP, VP jobs open. There are very, okay. very few VP of SEO jobs and there are very few people that have that VP of SEO title. Okay. So I don't think we're there yet. I, I do think we will get there. And then there's one other thing that happens in the SEO industry, which not completely dissimilar from other areas of marketing, is that there are a lot of people on the agency side. Mm -hmm. So those agency people get those you know, initial years of experience and they just move on to completely something else. And then you know, the companies right now, I know from my own hiring and from you know, the recruiters that reached out, they only want those people that are in large companies that have that experience. And for some reason, they think the agency experience isn't as valuable. Okay. I think that that will change as they realize there aren't that many people to hire. So as we you know, think about how many people have that title, you do sort of have to cut it both ways. Like how many people are in an at an agency and how many people are at a company. Okay, that makes sense. So we think about the broad scope of a career. I don't know, it, it, there was a simplified version of probably what a accelerated, um, SEO career looks like in terms of an optimal structure or like close to optimal in terms of thinking like, oh, are you in-house first and you're for two years and agency, et cetera, like you're at a startup, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if in your mind, like what would that at a very high level timeline look like, do you think? So uh, they always say this about marketing. No one teaches SEO and no one teaches SEM or any real interesting marketing things in school. Okay. So. Anybody that ended up in SEO, they probably did something else in school, and then somehow they accidentally found it, and they're like, wow, 
Th yeah. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> this clicks with me. I think they might finally be doing it, but it's probably pretty bad. Yeah. I think they're like, you know, after school, like, program, like, like continuing education course. programs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where like, they, it's an intro to SEO. I'd love for their schools to teach. I'd love to be able to teach one. I yeah, think yeah. it'd be interesting. But until people say, you know, go to school and say, that's, this is my career. I've chosen to do this. I want to major in SEO or major in digital marketing and specialize in SEO. People are just going to have to find it themselves. And when they find it, unfortunately, they're going to have to continue doing it where they are and then chart their own path. I know from my standpoint, I found it because I was doing biz dev, which is essentially sales at a company which was a lead generation company. So I was working with affiliates. And the affiliates that I was working with, this was you know early in 2008. And I had my own small piece of the helping out the mortgage crisis. I had affiliates that were generating mortgage leads and we paid them more for the, the worse the credit was. So it was the opposite of what I thought it should be. Even then it didn't make any okay. sense. Someone had poor credit, we paid them a lot per lead and someone had good credit, they only got a couple bucks. So the affiliates that I was working with, they were driving tens of thousands of dollars per month, all off of SEO. And then I read about SEO, got a hold of uh, Aaron Wall's book, SEO book, got a hold of Classic. every book there was to read. I went to the bookstore, uh, I read Bruce Clay's original SEO for Dummies book. Mm -hmm. And there weren't a lot of things out there. And what I did was I started reverse engineering all the websites of my affiliates. I was like, this isn't that hard. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was like, throw a lot of keywords on a page and then find websites where you can insert backlinks. So you didn't even have to like do any outreach. It was like Adobe had a forum, so you insert your backlink right, right. in Adobe. Wikipedia was a no follow. So you, you, you found a Wikipedia page that no one was going to call you out on for vandalizing, and you put your link in there. And I was like, right. it was really easy. So I like that. So like that's how I found it. I think now <laughs> you can't, certainly can't find it like that. So however someone stumbles into SEO, they, I think they do need to chart their career out. Like where do they want to be you know, in five years? Where do they want to be in 10 years? Mm -hmm and move along towards that path. So if they happen to be at an agency, where do they want to be in five years? Do they still want to be at the agency or do they want to be in-house? They need to get there. If they want to be at an agency, how do they keep getting promoted in the agency? Yeah, I think that's good. I uh, Kind of touching on some of the themes, I think generally starting an agency early is good to f accelerate some learning curve, I think, for people. Don't, don't have to stay there forever, uh, for sure. And then I think going in-house after a couple years, you'll get a pay bump is good. Um, definitely being in a major metro earlier in your career, I think, is a good call for people um, to, to have that opportunity. And then eventually you'll get to a point where you have a certain salary. And it will be hard as an SEO manager to get an aggressive salary bump internally at your own company. So you kind of have to go externally, as you kind of touched on. So you can either do that proactively or not. Um, or have people reach out to you in the recruiter standpoint, which is apparently more and more prevalent these days. Um, one thing that I found valuable, and it's, I don't know how early you did this in your career, but I would generally uh, suggest people do as well, is um, invest in personal brand to a degree. I think that can help you uh, adva advance further, get offers quicker. It helped me get offers quicker. It helps you get leads on the side, which is almost another conversation is eventually you can... F I'm sure in your context, they can't hire those companies. Those companies want a VP. They can't hire them, so they instead go to people like you, and now you can charge even more than a VP might in-house um, in those contexts. So investing in a personal brand, I think, is a good point. And you mentioned like pathing out your career. I do think not saying, I want to be the VP of SEO at Amazon, because what if one person at Amazon hates you or something in the interview process? <laughs> I've heard of people, I actually had the thought of in my career. I was like, I want to be a director of marketing for Nike. But, and I'm sure there are other people that have that thought too that just love Nike or some Apple or something. But if one person li doesn't like you, it's more about like how do you keep progressing. But um, yeah, I'm curious your own thoughts about personal brand and how that kind of ties into a career. It, it's obviously not required at all, but uh, it seems like you've leveraged it in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. But I do want to reference what you said about Nike. Yeah. <laughs> Nike was one of those companies that came to me. Okay. I believe their director of SEO position is still open. So if anybody out here listening or watching, <laughs> go apply for that job. That was uh, what I found to be very interesting was Nike had never done SEO before. So if you think about shopping for Nike, you find Nike on, on Zappos, you find Nike on Nordstrom. But Nike decided that wasn't okay. They actually want you to buy Nike from Nike. And 2019, that's what they wanted to do. And okay. they had never done SEO before, and this is how they wanted to do it. But that person had to be in Portland, and they had to report, sorry, now I'm saying bad things about that <laughs> job, but so kind of far down the totem pole. Okay. It was a director position, but there, there were many layers there. So 
as we think about like the growth of SEO, Nike figured it out. Many, many more companies are going to figure it out and want that in-house. And Nike, of course, like they do SEO. They have agencies. They they buy ads. Through, you know, they sponsor athletes. They've got marketing right, budget, yeah. <laughs> but they've decided they want to take some of that marketing budget and have an employee do it. So there, there, there will be many more companies all over the country, not just in tech hubs, that will be start doing that. So going to, to your point about personal brand, I think I sort of started building a personal brand accidentally, and then I realized how valuable it was. And I would say that you know anybody that has not invested in building a personal brand, they should start by just writing. You know, if they can write their own blog, depends on the company they're at. They may not be allowed to do that. Try to speak at conferences, and then there'll be a very very slow snowball effect. But they'll figure it out. Like it'll if it, either it's something they like doing or something they don't like doing. I don't think just being on Twitter will do it. Like, I don't think just like having opinions about SEO on Twitter is enough to build our personal brand because the right people aren't paying attention. But if you're blogging, certainly LinkedIn, if you're on LinkedIn, but you're sharing stuff you've written yourself, other people within other networks of, that you don't know will start noticing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And LinkedIn, Twitter was huge for me early in my career. LinkedIn is now, I feel like, similarly valuable in terms of a B2B content network. Um, I do think... And that's almost a side thought for an SEO that I see very commonly is I do think SurveyMonkey, I don't know when your kind of personal brand has started really snowballing, but that's a widely regard, highly regarded brand. So I'm sure that didn't hurt to a degree in terms of getting speaking gigs and recognition and things like that. And I see people often at like these SMX conferences and it's a director of SEO for notable brand and they get picked a lot of time because they're in that in-house role. So in some ways like that can be a second leverage point if you think about using that to your own benefit. Of course, you touched on not all of those companies for, the, for similar reasons will let you speak, um, but those things can work for you. So uh, kind of going back to the VP role and the difference between SEO manager, when you look at those roles and what they're trying to fill and maybe what are the attributes of the people that the SEO manager or maybe even the director that this VP or maybe the director doesn't have like what are what's the skill gap that they're looking for that often people don't have that maybe they should start solving for to get that job so it's really about being strategic like if you think that about the difference you know for anybody that's early in their career think about the people on top of you for anybody that's you know progressed a little bit and maybe you're at this role the difference between like someone junior and senior is the strategic abilities so if someone's a junior seo they're likely taking direction from someone else and this is, again, where a company is probably not valuing it as much if they don't have anybody senior in SEO. The person giving the directions actually doesn't know anything about SEO. So the direction they're giving is, it usually consists of, can you SEO this for me? Or like, have you done the SEO check on it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or can, what keyword should we be using? And it's not really around, what's our strategy? What do we want to do for SEO? You know, say we're Nike, like, how do we, we know we want to outrank Zappos who's selling our products. Like, how are we going to do that? And I don't need to do it tomorrow, but I need to know how it's going to happen in a year. And that's what I think they're looking for. They're looking for someone that can provide that direction, build consensus with the other teams that are going to be involved. If it, is it around a content play? Is it around building a marketplace? Is it around doing a rebrand? So if you're doing a rebrand, partnering with the design teams and the PR teams. So really at that high level saying, here's the strategy we're all going to work on together. And then here are the people that I have underneath me, because if someone's senior, their VP or director, they're going to have that junior person who they're, they're going to guide on what they should do, but also mentor them on how they can eventually take over for them. So for anybody in a junior role and doesn't have someone senior on top of them, that's an opportunity. Because you can take that strategic role and say to your boss, who probably doesn't want to necessarily be giving SEO direction, <laughs> and say, I, you know, I don't want to just do keyword research right now or, you know, write blog content or do you know, SEO tasks that just come off a checklist. What I'd like to be doing is I'd like to chart out a roadmap and I'd like to chart out a path for how we're going to be the dominant player in our industry and how we're going to not grow our traffic 5%, but we're going to grow our traffic 50%. That will get attention. So then you, you can build that out and now you've opened up a VP position that didn't prior to exist. Nice. Yeah, and I think... I mean, you're, you're, I think you're touching on this in that, but I think understanding uh, the, the bottom line and speaking in terms of dollars goes into that roadmap. Like, what is it going to cost us to achieve that? And making realistic uh, financial estimations, I think. I think a smart uh, VP and maybe it's just VP marketing generally 
we'll be able to look at something and be like, this is just wildly off from this point or this point. So having some accuracy there, and it takes repetition. And if you are in that role, I think they'll have a little more flexibility with you to know like, oh, this might be a little bit off, but you'll get better in kind of putting that in front of them and learning from that. So uh, this has been great. I kind of think as we think about um, careers and people in SEO in 2020 and things like that, like what do you think an, an actionable or quick takeaway people could do today to kind of progress their career forward? So whenever I have a career conversation, I always think the most important thing for anybody looking to move their career forward is that they have to take ownership. So they have to decide where it is they want to be. And you know, I've had too many career conversations with people who they don't like their job, but they haven't liked their job for three years. So if they take ownership of the fact that I don't like my job, they need to co also come up with somewhere they want to be and not just wait for the recruiter that dangles the right thing in front of them. <laughs> but they have to proactively say, this is what I want, and I'm going to make those recruiters dangle that in front of me, or I'm going to reach out to them, or I'm going to talk to a hiring manager and all that. That's the biggest thing they need to do. Second, if, if what they choose to do is progress in their SEO career and be able to provide more impact and provide more value, it's really getting into the data, being able to articulate as much about SEO as possible. And one of the best places to get data is look at paid marketing. So paid marketing, there's a lot of data. Sometimes that data could be wrong, but it supports a budget. So align with that budget and say you're spending this amount on a branded keyword. What about all the people that, kick, that click our branded organic result? Shouldn't that be worth as much money? You're spending this amount on this non-branded keyword what if I could rank us in that non-branded keyword and you can use that budget for something else? Shouldn't that be as valuable? So get into that conversation and start providing revenue numbers, data around it. You know, some, at larger companies, it's hard to get good data. It belongs to the data science team, belongs to the BI team. But get into Google Search Console. If there's an SEO person out there that doesn't have a Google Search Console, probably need to <laughs> re reconfigure whether they are an SEO person uh -huh. or not. But there's data there and there's, that's enough data to at least have the conversation and say, Here's, here's all the traffic we're getting on these pages that we didn't even try. Here's how much traffic we're getting on our branded result. We care so much about our brand and so on and so forth. That's data to make the conversation. And again, like you said, the data could be wrong, but at least it opens up that conversation. Okay, nice. Yeah, I think this has been great. Hopefully everyone goes out there and take, gets all those VP jobs after this conversation. Um, jumps from junior to VP right after this. Maybe not, but <laughs> yeah, I think this has been great. Uh, check out Eli's stuff. He's definitely got a great, a lot of great content uh, around enterprise SEO, and he's uh, a really smart mind on growth, growth generally. So um, thanks for coming in, Eli. I appreciate it. And if you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to us on uh, YouTube, iTunes, your listening portal of choice. And uh, thanks for watching. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Cool. <laughs> Golf clap. Should have clapped at the end, but.